kicking out this new series. It starts in the heart. We do have a series verse that is going to tie kind of a bow on the whole month. It's found in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Y'all know this. You're students of the Bible. Above all else, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. So this whole message is about it starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. Now, my anchor verse tied to this weekend is Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 39 on the screens. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now watch the emphasis and intentionality of Jesus' words on the second one. He said, a second is equally as important. Ooh, this is the one that messes with our humanity a little bit. Love your neighbor as yourself. Some of y'all are like, you don't know my neighbor? <laughs> this is coworkers, this is family, this is humanity. We are called to receive this love from him. Because by the way, he chose you before you chose him. He shaped and molded you in his image. He's faithful to complete the work he started in you. And so you can't take somebody to a place that you aren't yourself. So you receive the love, and then out of the overflow of what you've received, you then in return say, okay, I'm going to love her. I'm going to love him. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everybody. It doesn't even mean you have to associate with everybody. Some of y'all need to check your circle and disconnect from some toxicity already. But no, no, but it is, it is a directive as Christians to love everybody. We don't like it. We, some of y'all are like, you're a pastor. You're supposed to love everybody. Y'all are messy. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Just mostly the front row. Amen. <laughs> now, we, we, are, we, are, we are called to love one another. If you are taking down notes, the title of week one of It Starts in the Heart is, He Was Moved with Compassion. He was moved with compassion. Who is he? He is Jesus. He was moved with compassion. Let's pray. God, give us ears to hear you. We need it more than ever. There are so many things contending for our attention. There are so many things trying to distract us right now. So God, I thank you today that you give us ears to hear you, a heart ready to receive, a mind ready to understand it. I pray, God, that your word, because we love your word, we thank you that it's alive and active. It does not return to you void. Paul said, it's not with my enticing words, my perfect oratory delivery, but it is the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. I do not need fancy words, but God, let me speak everything today out of the unction and the leading of your spirit in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. He was moved with compassion. As Christians, we have instructions and directives that we are supposed to follow according to the Word of God. Now, I've preached this for a long time. Christianity is not about behavior modification. It is about heart transformation. It really does start in the heart. And again, if we're going to follow the biblical teachings of Jesus' life, which is, again, what the Bible instructs us to do, then we will also, as we grow stronger in our faith and get closer to Jesus, We'll begin to have a stronger desire to model and live our lives out of a place of compassion for others like Jesus did. In fact, five times in the Gospels, if you're a seasoned saint or you're brand new to the faith, the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Five times in the Gospels, there's this line that was used, and it's what pricked my heart and made me inspired to work on this message. Five times in the Gospels, we are told that Jesus was moved with compassion. He wasn't just compassionate, he was moved with compassion. And when you're moved, when we, all of us are moved with compassion and by compassion, you will start seeing people the way Jesus sees them. Not the way public opinion sees them, not how your feelings or your emotions sees them. No, you'll begin to see them through the eyes of kindness, mercy, and compassion. Pastor Jack and I were invited our, uh, Hope City Missions partnered with a, a phenomenal ministry called Mike Barber Ministries. They, they go into, uh, they have the largest and most phenomenal and most impactful prison ministry in the nation. And so how many of y'all have ever done a missions trip into prisons? We have them happening all the time. You can go to our Hope City Missions uh, area outside in the lobby and you can sign up and be a part. It's special. Some of y'all are like, they may keep me. Um, <laughs> 
No, it's really, really special. And so we got to go. Uh, Pastor Brandon called me and said, hey, do you and Pastor Jackie want to go? There's seven women in the state of Texas on death row. And uh, we, have, we have access to be able to go in and minister to them. Now, they've, they've all committed their lives to Jesus. They've all grown. Majority of their crimes were done in their 20s. They've been in there for 25, 30 years. Would you guys want to go? I said, does a shark like snacks? Yes. Like, we're there. Let's go. So we flew in, and we show up, and, and, and Pastor Brandon's dad pulled some strings with the warden, and we got to be in one room with all of them. They hadn't been out of their single cells for over 10 years. There was a lot of rules, don't touch them, all this stuff. As soon as the doors opened, Pastor Jackie rolled right up and started hugging everybody. They were all like, uh, okay. And I was like, she's gonna do what she wants to do. I'm gonna be honest. And the warden's like, you know, I feel good about it. And we're like, <laughs> Now I made a mistake. Watch this. I made a mistake. I Googled what they did before we went there. How many of y'all would have done that? <laughs> she said, no, I think a lot of you would have. The humanity side of us is like, well, what are we doing on wealth here? What are we dealing with? And you know, it skewed my ability to see them because I only could focus on what they had done. And I walk in that cell, and I was a little standoffish for a minute, and I started watching the interaction. I saw the compassion in her. I saw the team, Pastor Brandon, Pastor Kristen, and I looked in the eyes of the first lady and I felt the Holy Spirit say, you've never looked in the eyes of anyone that I don't love. And it was a sobering reminder of what Christ sees. That's why I said, you don't have to agree with, you don't have to hang out with, you don't have to spend a lot of time with, but we are called and we are instructed to love one another. Those ladies on death row, they're my neighbors. I'm choosing to love them. Choosing to love them. I'm choosing to love them. There are two books in the book of Matthew I want to look at that stood out to me when I was studying for this weekend. I'm going to set this moment up for all my Bible geeks that were like, well, I need a little bit more history. Pastor Daniel's really funny, and he has a cool shoe game, but I need some deeper theology. All right, so the first one, so sorry. So that happened. Um, the first one is found in Matthew chapter 14. This is right before Jesus. We're going to be looking at Matthew 14, 14. This is right before Jesus went to do the Sermon on the Mount, and he went and fed the multitude, the feeding of the 5,000. There's this little kid who says, I'll give up my, my tilapia and my baguette from Panera. And then Jesus is like, I can use this. And he ended up feeding 5,000 men is what the Bible says, but Bible theologians say that there were women and children, so upwards of 15 to 16,000 people were fed with this miracle. It is unreal. Now, right before that happened, Jesus had been staying in a place of solitude, and he was praying and spending time with God the Father because he had found out about the passing of his cousin, John the Baptist. Jesus is used to crowds forming, the multitudes pressing in around him, and he even got a way to spend time with the Father. This is why our model as Christians to be Christ-like is to take those moments, y'all. If you're too busy to pray, you're busier than God wants you to be. These moments of solitude and these moments, and watch this, I'm not talking about loneliness or isolation. I'm talking about a solitude place where you spend time with the Father and say, God, I need direction. I need, you to give, I need you to give me direction. I need your voice. I need wisdom, clarity in this decision. Jesus was spending time with the God, the Father, and then he's on his way now out of this moment of of, of the passing of his cousin. He's on his way and he experiences what they call the multitude. It's just a bunch of people. This is what it says and it's recorded in Matthew 14, 14. Jesus went out and he saw a great multitude. And this is the line. And he was moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion for them. And the overflow of him being moved with compassion was he healed the sick. Later on, the 20th chapter of the book of Matthew, verses 29 through 34, it says this, as they were leaving Jericho, so it's Jesus and his whole crew, and Jesus rolled deep like the Wu-Tang Clan. There was like 12, 13 people with him. He was like, let's go. So as they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed them. Verse 32, blind men were sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. Verse 31, the crowd scolded them. The Pharisees, the people that were like, hey, 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 these are less than. These people are bothersome. These people are outcast. 
How many of y'all have ever dealt with people like that, that throw shade at everybody that's not like them, or throw shade at everybody that doesn't stand or agree with everything they, oof. So, so I, need, I need you to just be quiet, because don't, don't you recognize we're in the presence of Jesus, and we can't even hear him speaking because of your, your shouting. So they're scolding them, saying, be quiet. Ah, but these men shouted even more loudly, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Verse 32 is so amazing. It says, Jesus, he stopped. Jesus stopped, called to them and said, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? This, this place of mercy. And they said, let our eyes be open. Verse 34, here's the line again. Moved with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes. And immediately, I felt this so strong this morning when I was re reading through this. Some of y'all before the end of the year are about to experience an immediately moment in your life. Immediately God healed my body. Immediately God showed up and fixed my mind. Immediately he restored my marriage. He, immediately he showed up and provided for, how many of y'all are believing for an immediately moment? Immediately he gave me direction and clarity and courage and fight. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Jesus understood the human condition, which is why he stopped and why he was moved with compassion, which is also why he hung on the cross. Y'all, for every single one of us, we get caught up in throwing all kinds of accusations and saying all kinds of things about other people. But Imago Dei means image of God. Everybody in this room, watching online across our other campuses, we were all created in the image of God. I was born conceived as an accident. I was conceived as an accident. My, my mom almost aborted me twice. People told her, well, you know that baby never is supposed to exist. Now I got a microphone and I'm kicking the devil in the teeth daily, taking territory when I didn't even have a voice the enemy tried to take me out. Image of God. Say, I'm, I'm, I'm the image of God. Now, God has a sense of humor. Just go to the mall and watch people. Amen. <laughs> Lord, what were you doing with this? <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> Jesus understood the human condition, which is why he ultimately hung on the cross for each and every one of us. Calls us by name. Knows us by name. Sees you. Chooses you every day, even when you don't choose him. The Bible says he cho chose you before you chose him. He says, oh, that's my girl right there. Oh, that's my boy right there. I love him. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. He understood the human condition, which is why he stopped and said, what, what would you like me to do for you? Number one, if you're taking down notes, compassion begins with understanding. Compassion begins with understanding. Compassion starts by seeing other people's pain just like Jesus did. Compassion is born from a place of empathy and understanding of other people's struggles. This understanding then moves us from judgment and indifference to a place of grace, love, and mercy. Let, let me break down why this is so important, how we can learn so much about Jesus's life. I pray you catch this. Roughly half of Jesus's miracles were interruptions. I, I, I'm gonna say it again. Roughly half of Jesus' miracles were interruptions. What do you mean by that, Pastor Daniel? Well, he had a plan. He even had an assignment and destination. But Jesus lived his life in such a way to be interruptible. He was never in such a hurry that he couldn't take a moment. Ooh, I, I needed it. Sometimes we miss out on opportunities to bless somebody, to speak a prophetic word into somebody's life, to just smile and look somebody in the eyes because we're just so busy. If you're too busy to reach out and move in compassion with somebody, then again, you're busier than God wants you to be. Some of y'all are losing your joy because you're caught up busy doing a bunch of things that aren't your business. Jesus had an agenda. He had an assignment. He had a mission, but he also lived his life to be interruptible. We saw it recorded in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20, the woman with the issue of blood. I preached about this woman's life for a long time. 12 years, she's considered unclean. Doctors can't help her. Family have disowned her. She, again, like the blind men, were an outcast. And Jesus comes walking by. The crowds, the multitude, pressed in around him. Again, watch this though. Jesus had to be walking slow enough for a woman that was hurting, broken, and sick to catch up with him. 
She fought her way through the crowd and tugged on the hem of his garment, and Jesus healed, restored, and delivered, and we never heard from her again because Jesus approached it as someone who could be interrupted. Nowadays, we're sitting there, we're like, why, why are you talking to me? Do I owe you money? Why are you interrupting me? Pastor Jackie and I have literally had people walk up to us at restaurants and say, I don't even know who you guys are, but I, I felt peace when you walked in the room. I wasn't wearing a shirt that says, need peace? Come over here, I'll pray for you. Like, <laughs> she wasn't carrying like anointing oil, like, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody catch her. Like, no, just the spirit of God that overflows. Here's what happens. You end up living your life moved with compassion. So Jesus was interruptible. I wonder, friend, how often we miss what God wants to do through each and every one of us because we hold so tightly to our own plans, our own agenda, our own ideology, our own opinions. Instead of seeing others, we have this heads down grind set mindset. Like, I gotta get me, myself, and I, and we end up missing out on moments to be moved with compassion. I got stories for days. You guys hearing me talk about uh, baristas and taking a moment to pray for somebody. I wasn't always that way. And the truth is, we're busy, y'all. We're really, really busy. Like, we're busy. We run really fast. Not physically. You could beat me in a race. <laughs> but it would be hard-pressed to outwork Red and I. We work. We're up early. We're up late at night. We run really fast. That's the way we were raised. That's the way we move. That's the way we operate. But sometimes, Pastor Jackie will remind me, hey, baby, you need to slow down a little bit. Slow down a little bit and view people through the eyes of compassion. And again, some of y'all are like, but aren't you, isn't that part of your requirements as a pastor? Yeah, and then y'all DM me 100 DMs and complain about things. And we'll quit talking about droid phones. I'm like, ah, it's an upgrade. Do the, do the right thing. I feel like people that have droids are like, <sighs> this is like the next step to like my dreams didn't come true. You know what I mean? Like things didn't work out like I was hoping. So <laughs> I got a droid. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting a DM about that. DM my wife over these things. Just say, hey, he needs to stop with the droids. All right, moving on. We've encountered so many waiters, waitresses, people in life. Have you noticed people are more on edge than ever before? Let's be honest. How many of y'all are on edge even more than ever? The political season, people blowing up your phone, like, who, how did you get my number? All the ads, the algorithms, everything is consuming us. And then you encounter a waiter or a waitress and Maybe they're not giving you the best service and you get frustrated about it. I tell our kids this all the time. You have no idea what they're going through. So we oftentimes will say, hey, are you okay? Is there anything we can do for you? Like for two reasons. Don't spit my food, amen. And then also, <laughs> but can we pray for you? Like you seem like you're stressed. You, we've had so many amazing conversations because we just took the time to slow down and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to and through. We slowed down long enough to give God an opportunity to prick our hearts so that we could be moved with compassion. Now, you don't have to do this. This is our rhythm, our cadence. We've been doing this for a long time. We actually budget in our monthly budget. By the way, if you don't have a budget, you need to get a budget. Like You need to know where your money's going, why it's going there. Like We have a budget, so we budget in. We know we got 10% of our increases, our tithes, we give back to Hope City. Above that, we give to local missions and we do what we do through Hope City missions. And then we budget in our bills, we budget in our expenses. And then we budget in a little bit of cash to be a blessing. We wanna be hope on demand. We wanna be able to move in compassion in the moment and not be like, it would've been really nice to have had an extra $20 to bless her with. So what's cool is we'll carry around some cash and then we'll encounter somebody and my kids will say, Dad, I think she's the one. I think he's the guy. I think we should bless them today. We actually budget this in so that we can move and be moved with compassion and prepared to look like Jesus 
in the moment. Because here's the truth. Number two, write this down. Compassion, it requires action. Compassion requires action. Which is why we do what we do every week with local missions. Because we're intentionally moving in the trajectory of romancing as many people to Jesus as possible. And we do that through compassion. Compassion goes beyond simply being feeling empathy. It requires us to take action. The Bible encourages us to not only feel for others, feel for others, but to step in and actually help. Genuine compassion naturally leads us to do something, even if it seems small. But what can I do? Y'all have heard me tell this illustration before, but there was the mom and dad, and they were out on the beach, and the tide had rolled in and was throwing starfish up on the beach. The whole beach was full of these starfish, and the little girl was just freaking out. She was running and grabbing them and trying to throw them back and throw them back, but there was more than she could handle, and, and all of a sudden, this guy walks over. You know the one guy? He's wearing that short so short you confuse it for a belt. It's a little too shiny. We're like, sir, is that butter? Like, what is happening? Why are you so slick? He walks over to the parents and says, why is she doing that? The mom's like, oh, she loves the starfish. And he's like, well, it's a waste of time. Hey, little girl, you can't save them all. What are you doing? And the little girl picked up the starfish and she walked right over to David Hasselhoff. And she put that starfish as high as she could reach towards him and said, I can't save them all, but I can save this one. She picked up another one and said, and I can save this one. And, and, and I can save this one. Compassion, y'all, it requires, it requires action. Compassion, acts of kindness, generosity, jumping on the dream team, not just being a spectator, but being a participator, being a part of the team so that you can serve and your gifts and your purpose can come alive. No matter how simple, it can mark someone for the rest of their life. It can be a meaningful impact. The man who walked up to my dad that one time my dad tried church. My dad wasn't church shopping and hopping. Wondering if it worked for him, like how's the coffee? Like, I wonder if it's gonna be smooth. I wonder if I'm, the parking's gonna be chaotic. It is here, and it's we're growing past it. Amen. The new building will be open a year from this month. Come on, Sam, buddy. But the guy who walked up to my dad, great first impression, shook my dad's hand. Said, "What's your name?" My dad said, "David." He said, "I've been waiting on you." My dad said, "Who told you I was coming? Do I owe you money? What are we doing right now?" You know, that first impression marked my dad 41 years later. My dad still talks about that moment, that act of kindness, no matter how simple, can be so meaningful and cause so much more impact. Helping someone in need, volunteering, giving to others are all practical ways of sharing the love of Jesus and being moved with kindness and moving with compassion. Now, speaking of compassion and action, my wife, let me brag on her for a minute. <laughs> Uh, she exudes compassion at a different level. She's inspired me. We've been married 20 years. Uh, she, she is so compassionate. She loves people. She was pre-med. She was going to go in the medical field. She ended up getting her master's degree in counseling, I think, just to fix me. And um, I'm like laying on the couch. She's like, tell me about it. I'm like, are you going to invoice this? What are we doing right now? And then she does, and I have to pay it. It gets weird. But um, even in the midst of things that didn't go our way, or didn't go like we had planned. I've just seen her respond with compassion. She won't talk about this herself, but I'll brag on her for a minute. She shared a little story last night at the W night, but let me tell it from my perspective. So a couple weeks ago, I get a call from her. She's going to get her hair done. Contrary to popular belief, that is not her natural hair color. Um, she's beautiful, looks like Kim Possible and Reba McIntyre, kind of a blend. Um, <laughs> So she calls, she's like, babe, my car sounds like it's pots and pans banging together. I'm like, huh? She's like, yeah, I, I literally don't know if I can make it uh, where we're going. She had the kids with them. I was like, all right, I'm coming. So I, I was, she was an hour away. So I'm rolling up and pull up. Sure enough, like something going on. Something's wrong. Something's real wrong. It smells like the car <laughs> is on its last leg. And so we have to have it towed and we're towing it. And the tow driver uh, parks it and he doesn't recognize that there's a sign. And so we're just dealing with something with the engine. The body on this Yukon is okay, but he drives it down the side of a sign and just tears up the whole back bumper. 
So he's like, hey, I could take the bumper off, no problem. He fixed the engine. It wasn't that big of a deal, praise God. But now she's driving around with the Yukon with no back bumper on it. She looks like she road rages all the time in Houston. Like, I'll back into you. Like, it's like a dog with no tail. It's weird looking. So she doesn't want to take the kids to school with the tailless truck. And so she's like, hey, let me get the keys. I'm going to drive the kids to school in your truck. She doesn't sound like that, but I got the mic. And I'm like, no. Mm -mm. And she's like, babe, let me, let me take the kids in the truck. No big deal. I can handle the truck. It's a big diesel. And I said, no, no, you just take, the, take your car. And she's like, it doesn't have a back bumper on. It looks weird. I don't want the kids. I was like, mm -mm. You get, your car is okay. It got fixed. Like, we're good. I can, like, duct tape that. Like, it doesn't even have to look that bad. I'll put some styrofoam on it. We'll figure it out. She's like, let me get them keys. And I'm like, no, 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 uh huh? I got places to go. She's like, where are you going? You can drive the Yukon. I was like, I'm not driving with no bumper. Like, <laughs> so then she's like, give me them keys. And I'm like, girl, I wear the pants. They may be short, but I wear the pants. And she was like, give the keys or I'm gonna punch you. And I'm like, okay, so I gave her the keys. And so her and the kids are leaving. And y'all, I just don't feel great about it. So as she's driving off, I'm like, Lord, I pray right now, God, I thank you for Psalms 91. <laughs> I'm pacing around the house like, God. And I'm not playing. Y'all, 16 minutes into this trip, my phone rings and it's her. And I'm like, hey, babe. And she's like, yeah, no, just turn on your fly shirts so nobody hits you. I can hear her yelling at somebody and I go, what happened? And she's like, I'm so sorry, babe. It wasn't my fault. This 20, 22 year old guy just didn't break and just slammed into the back of your truck. And I'm like, so husbands, I'm giving you pearls here. I said, but are you and the kids okay? Are you guys good? She's like, oh yeah, we're fine. Your truck's like a tank. And I go, so how's the truck? And she's like, oh, it's, it's mashed up pretty bad. I'm like, ha ah. Why are you telling us this story? Because I called my oldest son because she stopped answering the phone. And he picks it up. He's like, yeah. And I said, where's mom? He said, you know, mom, she runs to the danger. She runs to the chaos. She was more concerned about the kid who hit the truck by running back to him saying, are you okay? He's like, are you okay? Helped him out of his car. That's what being moved with compassion looks like. Last Sunday, we're leaving here after this service, and a guy thought the light was a suggestion over here. And he paused like it was a stop sign and then punched it and hit this group of teenagers. Their car spun around, and they're facing traffic coming at them. She kicks open her door, the one with no bumper on the back. She kicks open, and she's running towards them. I pull up, and I'm like, eh. Oh, no. And so I was like, ah. And then our head of security is like, why does she always run towards it? And I'm like, she thinks she's Kim Possible. She's a superhero. <laughs> and when she's mad, sometimes I'll throw a blanket on her and say, now you're super mad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but she runs right over. She's helping him out. She's stopping traffic. I go this way. And I'm like, babe, what on earth? You can't always do this. And this is what she said. She said, babe, I can't ever stand by and watch someone else be hurt. She got a revelation a long time ago. She started in medicine all the way till now with leadership. She got a revelation of what compassion looks like and what it looks like to be moved with compassion. You're a gift. Love you. Love you. Y'all, the reason why we packed over 200,000 meals this summer in the dead of the heat and we gave out meals to people that could never pay us back and barely thanked us to our city in need who lost power, the hurricane. How many of y'all were affected by the hurricane and then the tornado storm before that? That got crazy. Like that was actually almost worse than the hurricane. The reason why we packed over 200,000 meals and handed them out to reach our city is because we're a church that's moved with compassion. The reason why we're nine years old right now in January as a church organization, we're celebrating 10 years as a church. That's incredible. Now let me brag on you. Some of y'all are brand new and you're like, I haven't even given anything yet. That's okay. But everybody else who gives and you've been generous, y'all in the past nine years, we've given away almost $10 million to local, national, and global missions because of you. 
why do we do that? Because we're a church that's moved with compassion. The reason why over 600 people show up weekly and set up and tear down and turn gymnasiums into sanctuaries is because we know that people that need hope are going to show up. So we show up because we know that they're going to show up. Well, why though? Because we're a church that's moved with compassion. So this is why weekly, if you're new to Hope City, I ask you to come back, stick around, give us a year of your life. God will change everything. But for those of you who call Hope City home, the reason we talk about getting your roots down deep is because the Bible says, blessed is the man who plants his roots in the house of God. Ladies, your roots in the house of God. That's why we encourage you. It's not to get something from you. God's trying to get something to you and through you, which is why we say, become a tither. Start giving. Let your time, your talent, and your giving, let it reflect the heart of God through you. But I truly believe that because we're a church that's moved with compassion, this is why we show up and do what we do every single day and every single week. So here's my loaded question for everybody in the room and those watching online. When was the last time you were moved with compassion? When was the last time you were moved with compassion? Take a picture of that. Maybe write it on a sticky note. Put it on your mirror at home. When was the last time I was moved with compassion where you reached out to a neighbor or a coworker? When's the last time you prayed for someone? When's the last time you, even though they didn't agree with you or you didn't agree with them, you still took the time to listen instead of being the loudest voice in the room? When's the last time you asked for forgiveness or apologized for something you know was your issue or maybe you went and listened and heard out the other person and you know it wasn't your issue? When's the last time you've gone back and made a wrong right? When's the last time you said, hey, I, I, I wanna make this right because the Bible says if you have ought with a brother, go have a conversation when, with them. When's the last time? you treated others, watch this, like Jesus treated you. Y'all, when I wrote that in my notes, I literally started crying like, and you can't prove it because it disappears into the beard, but I was sitting in my office and I said, I never should have made it. Wave at me if you never should have made it. Come on, we got a bunch of never should have made it's in the room. I never should have made it. And the truth is, Jesus took his time hanging on that cross because he said your life was valuable. Your life was worth it. When's the last time you treated somebody else like Jesus treated you? When's the last time you were moved with compassion? You went out of your way to pray for someone, look him in the eyes to tell him that God loves him. Yeah, but you don't understand. They're, they're a different political party than I. All I see is humanity. I see someone who's loved by the same God that loves me and vice versa. I almost step on some toes possibly. I'm not trying to. But I want to be really transparent. We're talking about being moved with compassion. The political noise, a nation that's politically divided, yet a church that's supposed to be spiritually united. We're constantly having altercations and conversations. I told a friend of mine the other day, I said, do you realize in Genesis 127 and 128, it says that God created both man and woman, male and female, in his image. You realize that God, uh, Imago Dei, which means image of God, God created both of our presidential candidates in his image. People don't like to hear that. But are they breathing? Are they creations of God? Yes. Does that mean you have to agree with everything that they stand for? Absolutely not. But the truth is, we are still called to love. It is quiet in this Presbyterian church. Amen. We've never been to, uh, we've never been a church that takes big political stances. I'm not, this is, we're not I'm not an uh, activist. I'm an advocate. Uh, and we're not going to take a big political stance now. But I do want to encourage, we live in the land of the free because of the brave. And we have the incredible privilege and honor of voting and having the voice to vote. How many of y'all have already pre-voted? Come on, I just wanna, beautiful. We stood in line for an hour and a half with people that didn't agree and I didn't agree, yet we still laughed and talked and spent time because they're not my enemies. There's someone, a neighbor to be loved. And so the fifth is this Tuesday, and if you have not already voted, we wanna encourage you, let your voice be heard. Somebody told me in my family the other day, they're like, well, I'm not gonna vote this year. I said, they don't have an opinion. They said, well, that was kind of rude. I said, listen, statistically, there's 
51% of Christians have said they're going to vote. The other 49% said they're not going to vote. Yet they have all kinds of opinion on social. They want to text everybody and their brother what they think, but they're not letting their voice be heard. Barna Research projects 5 million additional Christians would vote if their pastor just encouraged them. So on behalf of my beautiful wife and me, we want to encourage you. Let your voice be heard. Go out and stand for what you believe in and let your voice be heard. But watch this. This is key. We are called to pray for those in authority. I have prayed since I've understood it. Since I was little, my parents taught me, we pray for everybody, even if it's not your party. We pray for everybody. Pray for Biden. I pray for Trump. I pray for Obama. I went all the way back. We pray. We pray for everyone because this is the Bible. This is what it says. And I'll give you some scriptures. The Bible says to pray for those who are in authority. First Timothy chapter two talks about praying for those in authority. Romans chapter 13 talks about praying for those in authority. Proverbs chapter 21 talks about praying for those in authority. Colossians chapter one says pray for those in authority. These are all verses, not my opinion. My opinion was to wear short pants with these cool socks today. The Bible says pray for those. It's extremely important that everything we do and how we view what we view, we view through the lens of the gospel, not through our political stance. It's so important that we're not making someone or a specific political party our savior because there is only one savior and his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I will continue to serve him, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who shaped and molded and created all of this. So we base everything we do, every decision we make upon the moral compass of the Bible, the Word of God, and then watch, we keep our eyes on Jesus first. Neither one of these parties are our Savior. Neither one of these parties are Jesus Christ. So we're going to trust whoever ends up in the White House, I'm going to pray for him. Whoever's in our local government, we're going to pray for him. Whoever is in our local cabinets, we're going to, we're going to pray for them. The Congress, we're going to, the Senate, the House, we're going to we're going to pray for them because we have more opinions than we're praying. If you have time to complain about it, then you have time to pray about it. I'm going to say it again. If you have time to get on social media and talk about everybody and throw shade at everybody who's voting different than you, then you better pray about it. The healing of our nation. The healing of our nation is dependent upon a praying, repentant church. I believe that. And this is the Bible. And as we follow as a church the biblical directive of this, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people, somebody say, I'm his people, who are called by my name, say, I'm his namesake. If they'll humble themselves, this is a choice, and they'll pray, seek my face, that's a choice, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive them of their sins, and I will heal their land so we fulfill our civic duty here in the United States and we vote. And then again, whoever ends up in the White House, we approach it with, I know who the King of Kings is and the Lord of Lords, and I'll also pray that God will move the hearts of the kings. He has the ability, it's all throughout the word, where he can move the hearts of the king. No one is so far lost that God can't get their attention through somebody. I think we should give God praise ahead of time for his faithfulness. Not the faithfulness of the government, his faithfulness. Now don't miss this. This is worth the drive today. Voting is how you let your voice be heard, but how you treat those who vote differently than you reveals and shows the kindness of God's heart through you. So if you can't love your neighbor, if your political passion makes it hard to love your neighbor, then a necessary adjustment is needed. Our communities are not filled with enemies to be defeated, but neighbors to be loved. My friend Ian Simpkins said that because we're all called as Christians, as sons and daughters, Christ like people, we're called to reflect the fruit of the Spirit. I was talking to somebody in the lobby a couple weeks ago and he said, um, I'm not sure I'll talk to my parents anymore outside of uh, heaven. I said, why? And he said, well, because they don't believe and stand for what I believe and I don't believe and stand for what they believe. I said, wait a minute. So, so how close have your parents and you been up until now? He said, oh, very close. I said, so you're burning a bridge over a political party? And he said, well, I'm not, I don't look at it that way. I said, y'all can argue again in four years. How about that? I'm not gonna burn a bridge with family or brothers and sisters because of their stance or my stance. I'm gonna vote and I'm gonna pray. 
and we're gonna trust that God will continue to be God and move in ways that we don't even understand. Matthew chapter 22. I hope y'all are getting something out of this. Verse 37 through 39, back to our anchor verse. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Again, he said, second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Number three, compassion should always reflect God's love. First John 4, 11 says, dear friends, since God loved you this much, we surely ought to love each other as long as they agree with you. As long as they have the same mindset as you. Now, again, you don't have to agree with everything that everybody thinks and you don't even have to spend time with them. But we are called, this verse, not my opinion, but this verse, God loved us this much. So we ought to love each other. Let us commit this is, my, this is my commitment. Let us commit to see God or people through the eyes of Jesus, responding with compassionate action, reflecting God's love in everything we say and do. Because again, true compassion trans, transforms not only their life, but it also changes, it changes your heart. Last verse, and we're gonna land the plane. Psalms 118.8 says, it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Come on, our God is big enough. Come on, somebody say, my God is big enough. Then all of this noise, my God is strong enough. Your best days are the rest of your days. I truly believe that. I don't believe the best days of our country is over. I've read the end of the book. We still win, y'all. God is still God and he is still good and he is still faithful and he is still kind and he is still merciful. So Lord, let us move like Jesus moved with compassion. Would you just lift your hands like this? My ask today, my ask for every one of you today is to not slip out really quick. Uh, we're gonna have a moment at the end of this service. We're gonna do a song here. Uh, a couple of friends of mine wrote a song called Jesus Be the Center of It All. And we're gonna sing that song. And then at the very end, I'm gonna give a quick altar call, but then we're gonna take communion as a family. Because I believe going into this week, we need to come back to the center of it all. And that's the core of our relationship with Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So no matter what happens this week, we're gonna trust that Jesus and God, our faithful friend has our back, our Father has our back and we're gonna trust him. And I wanna get back to the center of it all and take communion together as a church family. Would you lift your hands towards heaven? Actually, would you stand and lift your hands towards heaven and just close your eyes for a moment? Don't worry about anybody around you. Everybody has their opinions. Everybody has their thoughts. Everybody has a right to their voice and freedom of speech and all that. But this moment right here, I want to align our hearts to the King of Kings. I want to align, align our hearts to Jesus, the one who loves us, our healer, our restorer, the one that hung on that cross, shed his blood for us, took on the brokenness for all of our foolishness. So God, as we go into this moment, I pray, Lord, that you would touch hearts, families, that you would restore hope, that you'd bring peace to those who maybe have been feeling anxious and restless. Come on, honey. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From the beginning to the end. From beginning to the end. It will always be. Jesus be the center of it all. Sing it again. Jesus be the center of it all. Yeah, yeah. Jesus be the center of it all. From beginning to the end. From beginning to the end. It will always be. It's always been. Jesus be the center of my life. Come on, every voice, come on, speak this over your life. Jesus, be the center of my life. Come on, lift your hands and sing it. Say, Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, say, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always me. Jesus, be the center of your church. Come on, every voice. Jesus be, say, Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church. From beginning to the end, from the end, will always be, always be, always be you, Jesus. Jesus. 
be the center of it all. Jesus be the center of it all. All of it, Lord. From the beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus. Gee. Forgive us, God, for making it about anything else. God, today we ask that you would move in every one of our lives. We want to be a people that reflect your love. We're going to choose to love you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and we're going to choose to love our neighbor even when we don't agree. And they don't agree necessarily with us. We want to be a people that move with compassion. That's what Jesus did. We're supposed to model our lives like him. Now with every eye closed, with your hands down just for a moment, maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor Daniel, I needed this word. Some of us stepped on my toes, but the truth is I don't move with compassion because I don't know Jesus as my savior. One way to move with compassion is to align your life to the heart of Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 10 verses nine and 10, again, not my opinion, but the word that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. He's an alive God. He got up from the grave on the third day, paid every sin, compartmentalized issues and pain, and hung on that cross for all of your struggles. Or maybe you're the second invitation. You say, Pastor Daniel, the truth is I used to walk with Jesus, but today I was reminded that I'm not living or moving with compassion. And today I want to rededicate my life. I want to make Jesus the center of it all. If you were either one of those invitations, I want you to just slip up your hand right now. Pastor Daniel, you're talking about me. I want to give my life to Jesus the first time or rededicate my life. I see hands going up everywhere, 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 everywhere. Hands everywhere, everywhere. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Amazing. I see you, I see you, I see you. Incredible. Come on, can we give God praise for all the hands that just went up? All right, so we're all going to pray this prayer. Say this out loud, everybody, even if you didn't lift up your hands, say, Jesus, I'm asking you to be the center of it all. I repent for all my issues, all my struggles, all my indifferences, every ill word spoken. Here's all my stuff. I repent, and I'm asking you for forgiveness. Thank you for loving me enough to hang on the cross for my life, even though I didn't deserve it. Forgive me for not seeing others the way you have seen me. I repent and I want to serve you and live for you and declare that you are my Lord the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City, that's a great opportunity to shout.